Uh, also, last time I kind of like mentioned that I want to um, kind of like introduce a new JavaScript runtime, which is exciting. Everyone wants to have another JavaScript runtime, right? So, do you remember when Ryan Dahl approached uh, uh, JSConf in 2000? I don't know, and said, "I have this cool thing," and then you know, eventually Jared. Actually, he was speaking at SF Note um, where we recorded it, and not me, but uh, other people recorded it, put it on YouTube. That's when Bun was kind of like, you know, had this first steps, and Dino was also, I think, at uh, JSConf at some point. Uh, so this is the moment for my JavaScript runtime. It's called BX. Um, I will explain later. Um, the bare minimum for having a JavaScript runtime, right, is being able to execute JavaScript. Um, so I have a little um, example here. I hope it's big enough to read. I can squeeze a little bit more. So we want to execute some JavaScript here. So what we do is going to be example, and this is the console log.js. Um, and you will see um, if it takes a long, it's a very heavy JavaScript in, uh, runtime, but eventually it will print console log. So we reach our bare minimum for having a um, JavaScript runtime. The special thing about BX, um, the name, the letter B already explains it, is this JavaScript runtime is all about the web platform. Um, so it's essentially, it implements everything that the browser can do. It implements um, also in its runtime. Um, so the cool thing about this is now that we can say, uh, okay, we use just a window API to, to execute, um, to find out our user agent. And so if we run this now, um, we will get um, the, the headless Chrome um, user engine. We can also say, okay, I, want, I, don't want, um, I don't want Chrome, I want to have the edge flavor of the runtime. So we call it with edge. And we get um, headless edge, and the same for Firefox, um, uh, which will work the same way. Um, so this is the first thing. Uh, since it is, uh, it, you know, based on web platform, um, we can not only run um, JavaScript. This will be the first JavaScript runtime that can execute HTML. Um, so we have um, a little script here and a B tag, and what we do is uh, we kind of like query the B and get the text content. Uh, so same thing if we call example, uh, this is console log HTML. Um, we will be able to see hello world, great. Um, so how can I use this? Well, there are some many things you can do, uh, you can do for making this useful. It integrates into Node.js and Bun, whatever you have. Uh, so you can just import, it's like an NPM package, you can import it and, and run it. So here we have a benchmark test where it imports an NPM package, and it runs a benchmark on it, and it runs it uh, in Chrome and Firefox at the same time. Um, so if we run this um, example uh, benchmark, you will see that it first runs um, the Chrome benchmark, and then the Firefox benchmark, and then it prints out um, the mean um, for the slowest and fastest time. So you could do some performance tests in there, uh, which is neat. Um, last example, I think that's pretty cool, is we all do, we all love server-side rendering, right? Um, so every once in a while, we need to server-side render a component. I have a little lit component here. Um, it has a closed shadow mode um, and some, you know, simple render uh, function that pretty much prints the name of the browser uh, or the, yeah, the flavor, essentially. And where do I have my, uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. I've got to open it up here. Oh, it's this one. Uh, so, and I have a little core server, uh, which, um, you know, just takes some parameters, but the most important part is it has a render function also being imported from BX, um, this one. Um, and it basically, you just input some HTML and we'll render that and we'll output the output HTML. So you remember, this is a web component. So this means usually like you will see the, the web component without anything inside. Um, well, uh, in this case, you will actually get the full web component rendered in the browser. Um, so I will just spin this up. Um, example SSR. No. SSR. So it will start the core server, and I will go back into my browser, and I will say localhost 3000, and I will say uh, render. And it takes a little bit and say, oh, it actually rendered my component um, as like a... Um, Declare a shadow. Uh, so now, you know, my, where's my this? 
Now I can say, okay, um, browser name, the same deal, browser name dot Firefox. Uh, so I can server side render a component, but you will recognize, well, this is pretty pretty slow. Uh, like you need to have server side rendering going faster. Um, so I can just have oh, make this bigger. Get a new tab. Um, uh, I can just say, okay, uh, actually go back. Uh, BX. Um, go into. I can create a session that basically has this runtime running all the time, and it will make it faster. Um, so I say session, and I give it a browser name, uh, browser name Chrome, and I can even define the browser version flavor, uh, obviously. So um, I just run that. It starts the Chrome in the background, and so they can now run in the background, and if I um, de define my session name here, and this can all happen in the, like, not visible to the user. Um, so my session is Chrome 0 um, equals Chrome 0. Uh, then it immediately renders. So the browser's there. You don't have to st start the browser runtime every time again, so it's immediately there. Um, so obviously, this is not a JavaScript engine. It's a web Java IO that opens a browser and executes something that is uh, um, dynamically um, kind of like surfed with uh, VGS. Um, what I want to you know, point out with this talk is there's new browser automation features that you can now use to kind of like render uh, uh, web components um, and, and do those kind of funky things uh, because we have now a new automation protocol that is called, I should start from the beginning, um, that's called Web Java Baidai. Um, we all know Selenium, you know, is one of these automation tools that no one wants to use because it's slow. Um, that will eventually change because with the new Baidai protocol, um, that has been developed, um, we have now much more uh, capabilities, and I bet that tools like Playwright will eventually like jump and use that prior, uh, uh, protocol as well. Um, to give you a quick short overview about how browser are uh, automated today, um, there are essentially just three ways you can do it. Uh, you can use the web driver, the standard way, which is what Selenium and tools like web driver are using. Uh, you can use an emulation-based approach, which is what Cypress is doing. Um, where you use JavaScript to execute, to click on a button and send events to, to UI elements. Um, there's uh, Puppeteer and Playwright that are all DevTools based. That means that they uh, you know, uh, connect to the DevTools API of any browser. Uh, Playwright achieves that by giving you a, a kind of like a patched browser engine. Uh, so you actually never test on a real browser in Playwright. You get a you know, patched version from Microsoft. Um, but for, for hobby projects, in my opinion, that's, that's fine. Um, Selenium and WebDriver are all, you know, standard-based and, and WebDriver-based. Um, and, you know, I've seen a lot of, you know, talks about, you know, everyone uses Playwright by default. I think that has become the default choice. And I think, you know, if you would throw money on the problem and this is automation tooling, I think Microsoft did a good job in, like, building a tool that's very useful and, and, and uh, very nice and have, uh, good to use. Uh, however, for many folks, Playwright is not a solution because, again, you don't get the real browser that your users are using. Uh, especially for enterprise, it's a problem if you know you test on a browser that is at the end compiled by Microsoft. Um, so um, that's why people like I, uh, uh, me, or like a lot of people that work on Selenium are not happy with that project and you know work on alter alternative solutions. And the reason why many people were not happy with Selenium is that the WebDriver protocol is inherently slow. Um, if you have a client like WebDriverL, you say, "Hey, go to my page." Um, then you have a driver that understands that command and kind of like goes to the browser factory, I would call it. Think about the browser factory of like a browser, a mobile device, anything that can speak web driver. Um, and as you can see, in order to send a command, this driver has to go to the browser factory, tells the people in there how to execute the command, and then comes back with the result, which essentially translates to the browser driver understands how the browser works internally because it can connect to the DevTools protocol, executes this through the DevTools protocol, which is something that WebDriver doesn't know about. Um, and you know, comes back with the result. And as you can see here, this is kind of slow because it's a sequential process. However, uh, I, don't, I, don't, un, uh, I don't agree with the argument that it's slow because you can um, scale this idea to having thousands of browser factories and doing one command to 1,000 devices at the same time. And you have companies like BrowserStack or Sauce Labs who made a business out of this. 
essentially how it works if you, again, you have a browser driver, every browser ships with a driver, and the browser vendor is actually also sitting on the standards table to you know, make decision how the web server protocol works. Um, but the driver essentially is help, helping us to translate a minimal set of actions that is defined in the web driver protocol uh, to make it happen in the browser. Um, and the web driver specification, the original one, um, has especially an API uh, server that gets, um, has, defines an endpoint um, that represents a command, like a click. Um, in those URL, you have an element reference and the session ID to target the right browser. And this is a web driver package. It's fragile because it goes over the internet. Um, you know, sometimes you have to resend uh, those packages. But again, what web driver was doing, it would send the, you know, the command as a network package to the driver. And the driver is constantly connected with the browser to understand if the browser is um, accessible, if the, you know, there's no alert that can you know, prohibit uh, uh, an execution. And so there's con constant communication. And as well, if you, for instance, the click command, um, it's a little bit small, but essentially there's a number of things that happen um, that the browser driver is doing from evaluating if the page is accessible to like um, throwing multiple mouse events to really emulate what a user would do at the end. At the end, the package was being sent back, and we have either a successful or a failing uh, command. Now, the web driver protocol was started to be standardized around 2012, which is the time when kind of like people started to use Backbone.js and things like that. The problem with that is like when, these, when they started to define the first primitives for the protocol, eventually like React came up or Angular came up. And so the way people would build application, front-end application today, have, would have has changed uh, tr uh, tremendously, which has caused to make this protocol not that useful anymore because the protocol was designed with the idea of do everything that the user can do. And for a developer, they want to have more introspection about what the network is actually doing. Is there any errors being thrown on the website? Things like that. Um, couldn't do, be done with the web driver protocol and the way it's designed, but the BIDA protocol that is now being worked on and every browser version now ships with new primitives for the BIDA protocol kind of like has much more power than WebDriver. Um, for a big extent, you don't, even, don't only have access to what a user could do, you now have access to a lot of primitives uh, that is important for the browser, being the network, the browsing context, the user context like profiles, um, and the console log, for instance. Uh, the principle is the same. You have a driver still that does all the translations, um, but now the, the WebDriver by that command is a WebSocket which allows us the bi-directional com uh, communication. Um, it's a byte package, it's still like a socket message, but now you don't have to reestablish a connection with the driver any, uh, anymore, uh, ever, always again. You now have a constant connection to the driver, which makes things a little bit more faster. Um, another thing that would change is, especially for frameworks that you use, for instance, Selenium or WebDriver.io, is like, we now have a constant connection to the browser driver as well to uh, understand Network requests come in to give you some more easier like ways to um, understand if there's an error happening uh, and so on. Um, the driver still connects, uh, works in a different way. The, the standard is a little bit differently implemented based on the browser itself, but um, it's pretty much the same. And if you looked at the protocol, there's a couple of like interesting things that I want to go through. Um, uh, one thing uh, to enable by day today for tools like WebDriver.io, um, you send, you know, when you send your capabilities, like which browser name you want to use, um, you can now send a WebSocket URL true, which kind of like established this bidirectional communication. And then you will have commands sent being through the classic protocol or with the new BIDA protocol. Um, and one new thing that finally happens is now we can listen to log events that happen in the browser, errors that are being thrown on the website. Uh, we can now, since it's a bidirectional com communication, we can now like listen in and be like, hey, there's something happened after you clicked on the button. Um, you can, uh, WebDriver provides fully type safe uh, commands, so you first tell which events are interested to you. Um, since there's so much going on in the browser, you, don't, you cannot really listen to everything because otherwise you would kind of beat us yourself. Um, this, um, you, you, the, the protocol is designed in a way that you tell the protocol which, which events are interested to you, interesting to you, and then you listen on that event, um, and then in this case, we listen on the lock event and we trigger it by calling the execute command. And this gives you like a, a JSON blob with some interesting information about this network, uh, this lock call. Um, another interesting new thing in the BIDA protocol is they allow you to run some preload script. And 
as opposed to, uh, you know, usually how it works is when you cannot change the prototypes of native um, web primitives. Uh, so every, like the navigator, the window, they are all kind of like, the objects are frozen, so you cannot mutate them after your page is being rendered. The preload script actually allows, uh, allows us to do that, which kind of like allowed me to do all these fancy things of rendering the, um, the shadow dome, which I will talk in a second. Um, so with this little neat trick, we can now inject a preload script on every website that's being loaded and kind of like overwrite how Navigator geolocation works and kind of like emulate the geolocation based on your um, desire. Um, the same works for the user agent um, or other things. Um, another thing that, you know, kind of like was the whole premise of the talk is like, you know, being able to look in and render web components. Web, testing web components always has been a challenging thing because you, you have to go into the shadow root to understand what's within the shadow component, uh, within the web component. Um, that always has been tricky. So if we have like a, a component, like the button, that with a, which is within my component E, which is within the my component A, um, I wouldn't be able to access it because they are all hidden within these uh, shadow roots. Um, so how can we get access to it? The classic protocol allowed us to have some ways to get into it through the shadow co command, which kind of like uh, does the hop of going into the uh, shadow root. Um, but that is not really reliable, but because let's say we re-render our, um, our component and that component that we are looking after is now more nested into another different web component. Um, so this is not really a reliable way to look into, uh, to find the right component or work with the right component. Now, the preload script comes to the rescue. Um, now I can override the way how custom elements define works and basically say, okay, whenever, whenever you give me a constructor for a web component, I will just extend it and I will lock the, the nodes that are being registered, which is the node of the web component and the node of the shadow root, the, the document fragment of the shadow root. Um, and this, the web driver protocol translates this into a web reference or into a reference, which is essentially just a string, um, which I can then use to, um, you know, work with that web component. And that worked. Well, I can now access, I can now listen to all the web components that are being created, have access to the shadow root, and can now do the element lookups within that shadow root in parallel and solve the problem. If there wouldn't be um, the closed shadow components, um, if you look at our example again, uh, you will see that I kind of like, like look into the, uh, use the this.chatter root, and for closed web components, uh, this.chatter root returns null, um, which is a problem. So our example doesn't work anymore, but there's another trick we can do by overriding the attached shadow primitive uh, on the element object, um, which returns uh, the shadow root, no matter if it's closed or open. Um, so now I again get access to uh, the shadow root again, and can do my tricks. Um, another problem that we have is like doing snapshot testing with web components. Um, getting the source within of a shadow root wouldn't be possible because it's just not being exposed through the native JavaScript primitives. Um, now that I have access to all the shadow roots uh, of my web components, I can now grab the HTML and kind of like com compose together uh, the HTML. And WebDriver does this by kind of like creating, uh, creating a declarative shadow DOM for you so it includes the styles and everything you're interested in. Um, some other interesting facts that now are now possible um, across all browsers is um, um, the uh, things like uh, executing JavaScript um, on, on the website can now do things like, um, uh, you know, return, maybe return me all the HTML of the web components. So there's a little include shadow tree in there, uh, which I discovered going through the spec. There's not much mentioned what it will do, but eventually it could do things, uh, which is an interesting thing of like looking through specs. Um, more importantly, um, there will be new selectors that help us to select elements through um, accessibility locators and inner text locators. And again, all those things have been existing before, but kind of in a hacky way where we would JavaScript we use JavaScript to kind of uh, use, uh, or XPath to kind of like find out if the you know, uh, accessibility label is actually applied on that element. Now we get actually the rendered uh, accessibility tree from the browser to actually find the uh, right um, you know, element based on the accessibility locator, uh, which is pretty neat. Uh, and lastly, what I want to talk about is uh, network interception. 
Again, accessing the network stack of the browser is very important to find out if a certain API request has been made, been made successfully or not. Um, and there are no primitives for that too. Um, they look kind of like difficult to use, which is normal when you use the raw protocol, especially with WebDriver. Um, you look for a response um, and then, or first off, um, you define a network interception uh, resource. Um, basically, you define a URL or a resource that you want to intercept. And then you listen on the event, on the response, and um, modify it if you think you want um, it, it needs to change. Um, so all of this looks complicated. This is why tools like WebDriver.io make it a little bit more simple uh, by just having a mock primitive that allows you to mock using um, you know, a, a star uh, character to just you know, have, say, like, I want to everything. I don't care about the host, just everything slash API, which is more convenient and have a simple return uh, or respond. Or say I want to respond once, um, and then similar like how Jest works and mock return value, things like that. And so all these new primitives will be uh, available in Reptor version 9, where kind of like we try to make Reptor by the default, and I hope until then most of the browsers um, will have these primitives shipped. Um, unfortunately, we haven't seen any development in Safari yet, um, but they have said that they are interested or that they are willing to implement the standard. But this is how it is with standards sometimes that you have different, you know, browser vendors have different amount of interest to actually, uh, you know, do the work. And jo I think John mentioned, like, Apple is a little bit more conservative when it comes to those things. So it naturally takes a little bit more time. Um, but all these new primitives will land in web uh, version 9, um, which we will ship hopefully mid end of this year. Um, and um, yeah. Well, you can already try it today uh, using the next tag and um, use WebDriver for um, you know hydrating your uh, web components if you like. Um, which is, I think, you know, if you if you know about other solutions, they usually have an HTML comment to allow to reconcile the the component. Um, this probably is not needed anymore. At least in Stencil, a project that I work on, we we cannot cannot do it without it. Um, so with that being said, um, thank you so much.